Hi there, I'm Martin Brock. Uh, welcome to the laboratory on the identification of functional groups. Uh, a significant function of science is the identification of different compounds that may have socially significant value. For example, in medical diagnostics, one might want to determine what kinds of compounds are causing a person to become ill. Or in forensic science, uh, one might be interested in going to a crime scene and identifying the compounds you see at a crime scene to help you understand uh, the character of the crime. Uh, in, uh, in, in an arson investigation, looking for certain kinds of flammable substances uh, as the identification of such compounds would be very important in determining uh, who the perpetrator of such a crime might have been. Uh, different companies around us assess environmental quality. Uh, such companies might be interested in looking at uh, certain compounds in our water or in our air or in the food that we eat. So uh, identifying unknown compounds is a very important part of science uh, as it serves society. Uh, another thing that a scientist might do would be to, to develop new uh, socially important compounds such as pharmaceutical agents, uh, drugs or, or chemotherapeutic agents or novel insecticides, better insecticides. Uh, there are in the world around us many plants who, which produce such compounds uh, and a chemist's task might be to, to isolate, identify, characterize such compounds. Uh, in all these kinds of investigations, we start with a set of standards, known compounds, and compare our unknown compounds to that set of known compounds to identify the compounds that we're interested in. Um, uh, such, a, such an investigation is very much like that of a mystery novel. Uh, Sherlock Holmes once remarked that um, uh, that once, <laughs> once you have eliminated uh, the impossible, uh, anything else, however improbable, must be the truth. And that is our task in this kind of a, of a laboratory environment, to, to eliminate from consideration compounds that are unknown might not be, and to only expect it to be, behave like certain known compounds. On the bench in front of us is a variety of, of, of components for this laboratory. We have a set of, of standards, which are known compounds to test uh, we have a set of reagents, each one of which is a different reactive compound. Uh, we have a set of test tubes that we can use for some of our reactions to carry them out in. And we have a porcelain spot plate, which we can use um, also uh, to carry out our reactions in. In addition, in front of, our, in front of us, we have a, a hot plate uh, containing hot, hot water. <laughs> hot water. <laughs> and we have... Uh, and we have a waste container uh, to put our waste products in. Uh, and we also have a, a set of goggles uh, for safety. And I'll put these on now, which you must do also in your experiments. Now our first test, we're going to do three tests out of our experiment as examples. Uh, the first one involves the use of pH paper. This pH paper is colored and can change color in response to uh, certain kinds of reactions. For example, um, some standards I might add to the pH paper um, would have, um, may have no, no change whatsoever. Place on the pH paper one drop of one of your standard solutions. And then compare the color that you see there with the color on the, on the, the, the vial containing the pH paper. As you can see, this doesn't have any significant color change, which means that it doesn't have any acidity associated with it. Uh, be sure to keep the chemicals off the table and lay it down in an appropriate uh, location, perhaps on the spot plate. Then try another standard on the pH paper and see how it changes color. This standard gives a, a blue color. We can compare this blue color with the, uh, with the colors on the pH uh, bottle, and you can see it says that it is strongly alkaline. You would record that information also on your on your observation sheet. Um, another another standard can be done on another uh, piece of of, of uh, pH paper. This causes an additional color change. There are several possible color changes that you can see with the pH paper. 
Again, comparing this, see that this color change, a red color, indicates that this sample is, is an acid. When you're finished with all of the, uh, with all the pH paper, be sure to throw all of the pieces that you used into the trash. On our next test, we're going to do Benedict's test. Benedict's test will use four test tubes because we've eliminated all but four of our samples. In Benedict's test, we will take our Benedict's solution, this blue solution, and add five drops to each one of our four test tubes. We have four test tubes now, each filled with uh, some drops of our blue Benedict solution. We're going to add to the test tubes now our standard solutions. Uh, we want to keep track which tube contains which standard, so we should label each tube with uh, the number of the sample that we're going to be adding. We could use a pencil on the white space indicating which tube that we have. I'm labeling these now with sequential numbers. You may use the names of the standards if you wish. But it's important to keep track of which tube is which. Now add standard, first standard to the first test tube. Add three drops. Of the first standard to the first tube. And swirl to mix. Add three drops of the second standard to the tube, to the second tube, and swirl to mix. Again, add standard three to the third tube, three drops. Swirl to mix. And finally, add the last standard to the last tube. and swirl to mix. Now we place all four standard tubes into the water bath and let them heat for five to ten minutes until a color change occurs. When you're finished with Benedict's test, uh, you need to record on your observation sheet the color changes that you see, and then you must get rid of the, the solutions by washing them into uh, your waste container. Be sure to keep your waste container covered up so that the, the uh, chemicals don't evaporate into the room and smell the room up badly. The final test I'm going to show you is the dinitrobenzene test or the DNB test. This test uses, um, starts with the, uh, the methanolic potassium hydroxide. You're going to use four wells in this test. Be sure and this and all the tests involving the spot plate, the spot plate is clean and dry. We're going to put in two drops of the methanolic sodium hydroxide in each of four wells, followed by two drops of the standards, two drops of the first standard into the first well, two drops of the second standard into the second well, 
two drops of the third standard into the third well, and two drops of the final standard into the final well. Uh, it's a good idea to shake it up a little bit, do that by, to mix it up by just rocking the, the spot plate gently a few times back and forth. At this point, there will be no colors visible in your sample. Colors will occur, appear after you add two drops of the dinitrobenzene reagent to each well. Two drops in the first well, two drops in the second well, two drops in the third well, and two drops in the last well. With the dinitrobenzene, uh, some of the wells will give a slight color change. You're only interested in a very intense dark purple stain, as we see right in front of us here. That would indicate a positive result in this test. Uh, when you're finished with this test, be sure to record in your observation sheet uh, what you see, and then rinse out this again into the waste container. Okay, I've now shown you three of the tests in this experiment. There are several other tests that you must perform in addition to these three tests. Those tests are similar to the tests you've done, some tests involving pieces of paper, some tests involving the spot plate in addition. When you have finished performing all of these tests and you have recorded the information, your observations on the observation sheet, then you must prepare a flow chart. This flow chart, like the one in your book, can be used as a road map to help you identify the compounds in your unknown sample. To use this flow chart, you need to fill in into each box uh, the standards that you tested in your various tests. For example, in Benedict's test, some of your standards gave you a positive signal and some of your standards gave you a negative signal. You write the name of the standard that gave the positive result in the positive box and the name of the results of the standards that gave you the negative results in the negative box. Do that for each one of your tests. When you're finished with this flow chart, give the flow chart to your laboratory instructor along with your observation sheet, and your instructor will then give you a, a, a sample of the unknown that you can test. When you receive your unknown from your instructor, you will get a vial containing the unknown and a dropper. The vial will have uh, the unknown number, which your instructor will record uh, for you. Of course, you don't know what's in the unknown. That's the point of the unknown. The flow chart will help you with this. In following the chart, you do just enough testing until your unknown is clearly identified. You might be lucky and identify it in the first test, or you might be less lucky and need to perform all of the tests. You never know. By following good observational skills and using good reasoning skills, which are the real reasons for you doing this lab, you should be able to easily identify your unknown sample. When you have finished with your unknowns, be sure to clean up after yourself. You need to record your results from the unknown onto your result sheet. And you must certainly take the waste material in the waste container up to the hood and pour the contents into the special receptacle there and bring it back to your bench I hope that you had good success with this, with this experiment and that you identified your unknowns correctly.